This is the review for Unit 6, Metabolism. If we wanted to find metabolism, then uh, it would probably be best to describe it as a sum of all the chemical reactions happening in your body. And in order for your body to do all these chemical reactions, it needs the energy to do this. So how does your body get the energy to, to do all the chemical reactions that are happening inside of it continuously? Well, it uses this process called cellular respiration. And what happens in this process is we take in glucose, right, right? We ingest glucose. And then in the presence of oxygen, we're able to break glucose down. And what results from that is carbon dioxide and water. And we also produce this usable form of energy, that, this form of ener chemical, chemical energy that our cells can use directly to do things and that is called ATP. So the whole reason this whole process happens is to create this ATP or this energy that our cells need to stay alive. Not only do animals undergo cellular respiration, also um, fungi do this, mushrooms do this, plants do this as well. So plants also must break down the glucose that they make and they must convert that glucose into ATP so that they can actually grow and do things. Where does this whole process happen? Well, it's all going to happen in structures called mitochondria. So mitochondria is where this whole conversion happens. If we want to measure how much me metabolic activity is happening in a cell or how much energy they're using, one way that we can measure this is just by measuring the amount of oxygen being consumed because oxygen is something that is essential in this process. And when we breathe in oxygen, that oxygen is eventually traveling to our mitochondria inside each one of our cells. And in these mitochondria is where glucose is being converted into energy. So the first objective says calculate weight-specific oxygen consumption rates and note the effects of temperature on metabolic activity in insects. Well, first let's talk about how we can measure metabolic activity. So as I said, we can measure it as the amount of oxygen being consumed. So this would be considered the whole animal metabolic rate. So this is the total amount of oxygen consumed in a certain amount of time. So the units for this would be milliliters of oxygen consumed per minute or per hour, whatever unit of time you're looking at. So for example, you had to calculate the metabolic rate of some cockroaches. So you calculated it in two different temperatures. And at 26, in room temperature, 26.2 degrees Celsius, your metabolic rate calculation was 0 0.049332 milliliters per minute. But whenever the temperature was colder, you notice that the metabolic rate decreased down to 0 0.033384 milliliters per minute. So what you saw here is that cockroaches actually consume less oxygen, or in other words, have a lower metabolic rate when temperatures get colder. But you also want to know how to calculate the weight-specific metabolic rate. And this is important because larger organisms are typically going or larger organisms are always going to be consuming more oxygen than a smaller organism. So if you want to control for that difference, then you can calculate what's called the weight-specific metabolic rate. This is the amount of oxygen consumed per unit time per unit of mass. So our units in this case will either be milliliters per minute per gram or milliliters per gram per minute. You could write the units in either way, the main thing that you just need to make sure is that milliliters comes first and that grams and minutes is in the denominator. So what this is telling you is the amount of oxygen, the milliliters of oxygen being consumed per minute per gram of tissue of that organism. So imagine if you actually took out a little section of the tissue and you were looking at how much energy that gram of tissue was using. All right. And this is important because this allows you to compare organisms of different size to see whether they're using the same amount of energy relative to their size. So in order to calculate the weight specific metabolic rate, it's really simple. All you got to do is take the oxygen consumption rate 
which is milliliters per minute, right? And just divide it by the mass of the organism. So divide it by its weight. And the another word for oxygen consumption rate is simply metabolic rate. So you're taking the metabolic rate and dividing by the body mass. So let's look at our cockroaches that we cal we um, calculated the metabolic rate for before. Well, if we wanted to calculate the waste specific metabolic rate, we'll just take that number we had before, divide by its mass, which was 8.7 grams, and you would get 0 0.0057 milliliters per gram per minute. Do the same thing in the cold temperature, since it's the same cockroach, it's the same mass, and there you get your um, weight specific metabolic rate. This isn't as important in organisms that we call ectotherms, but when we start talking about endotherms, this is gonna become really, really important, this weight-specific metabolic rate. So let's do some practice here, um, calculating weight-specific metabolic rate. This one says you have a 2,000 gram dog that consumes 1,500 milliliters of oxygen in 60 minutes. What is the weight-specific oxygen consumption for this animal? So first you gotta figure out the oxygen consumption rate, which is just simply, 1,500 milliliters divided by 60 minutes. So that gives me 25 milliliters per minute. And then I take that number and I divide by the mass. So again, you always want to calculate it all the way out. And that's 0 0.0125 milliliters per gram per minute. So another part of the first objective says to look at the effects of temperature on metabolic activity in insects. Um, before we do this, let's talk about the different thermal strategies found in living organisms. So living organisms typically have two different thermal strategies or how their body regulates temperature. One is called an, um, ectotherms. Ectotherms are organisms whose body temperature is determined by the environmental temperature. These organisms cannot produce their own heat. So instead, their body temperature is dependent on whatever the environmental temperature is. If they move to a warmer environment, then their body temperature is warmer. If they go to a colder environment, then their body temperature is colder. So if we were to look at the relationship between environmental temperature and body temperature, we would see a direct relationship there. So what type of animals are ectotherms? This is something you should know for the exam. This would include insects, like beetles or honeybees or flies. Uh, it would include spiders, reptiles and amphibians are all ectotherms, fish are ectotherms, and if you want to talk, include a bunch of different living organisms, even plants. Plants are ectotherms. They can't produce their own heat. The other type of thermal strategy is called an endotherm. Endo, that prefix means within. Right? So endo, these mean organisms that can produce heat from within their bodies. So these organisms, their body temperature is independent of the environmental temperature. It doesn't matter if the outside's cold or if they're in a hot environment, they're going to be able to regulate and keep a constant body temperature because they can produce their own heat. So if we were to look at the relationship between environmental temperature and body temperature, we would say see that the body temperature stays constant. It's not affected at all by the environmental temperature. What type of organisms are endotherms? These include anything furry. So mammals would be endotherms. Also, another large group of organisms that are endotherms are birds. So birds also can produce their own heat. So knowing these two different thermal strategies, let's talk about how an environmental temperature can affect their metabolic rate. Well, here is a graph showing both the effect of an ecto of environmental temperature on an ectotherm and endotherm. So let's talk about ectotherms first. So remember, these are organisms that get their heat from the outside. That's what ecto means, outside. So ectotherms are going to first of all, have a lower metabolic rate than endotherms because they don't really have to use a lot of energy to maintain a body temperature or anything. So what you're going to see, however, is that as the environmental temperature increases, an ectotherm's oxygen consumption, or in other words, metabolic rate, also will increase. And this just has to do with the fact that 
that their body temperature is increasing. So as an organism's body temperature increases, it allows them to be more active, and that would cause them to take in more oxygen. When an ectotherm, whenever the environmental temperature gets colder, an ectotherm will just passively cool down with the environmental temperature, so their metabolic rate will s slow down, and they'll consume less and less oxygen, and they'll become more and more inactive usually. And eventually they'll probably not be able to really move very much because they just don't have enough um, enough energy to move. However, if we look at an endotherm, we see a different relationship here. An endotherm has the lowest metabolic rate in what I like to call the comfort zone. So this is a range of temperatures that is rather comfortable for this endotherm. All right, so it's usually temperatures, um, maybe think about this as like room temperature or so. So between say, around 27 degrees Celsius to maybe like 35 or 36 degrees Celsius would be like your comfort zone. Remember our body temperature, the human body temperature is around 37 degrees Celsius. So that is uh, maybe a, our body temperature might be a little bit above this range. So temperatures that are slightly below our body temperature, it's pretty comfortable. That's our comfort zone. We don't have to work very hard to keep our body temperature constant. However, as the temperature gets lower, as the environmental temperature gets lower than our comfort zone, what happens to an endotherm? Well, they have to start actively producing heat so they can maintain that constant body temperature. So their oxygen consumption rate starts to increase drastically as temperatures get cold. And that's because they have to use energy again to produce heat. And what, what do we do when we get cold? We start shivering, right? When we start shivering, we start to, to actually increase our metabolic rate so that we can produce more body heat. So that's very different than an ectotherm, right? An ectotherm's metabolic rate decreases as it got colder. For an endotherm, it's going to increase when it gets colder. Also, whenever it gets really hot, an endotherm's metabolic rate will actually increase again. And that's because they have to actively work to cool down their body temperature and get back to that stable state. So you want to know the difference between these two th different organisms. An endotherm, again, they're going to have the lowest metabolic rate in the middle, and then it's going to increase as the temperature gets too cold or too hot. For an ectotherm, it's going to, their metabolic rate increases gradually as the environmental temperature increases. Objective two says identify spiracles and tracheae in insects and compare the general function of this gas exchange system to lungs. So pretty much you just want to know how do insects get oxygen. They need oxygen for metabolism, but they don't have lungs like we do. So instead, insects actually take in oxygen through tiny little pores located on their body. And you can see these little openings here and they are called spiracles. So these tiny little openings is where oxygen enters. And then it actually will move through a bunch of tiny tubes within their body. And these tiny tubes are called tracheae. And these tubes will come into contact with the actual muscles and stuff inside the insect and allow oxygen to diffuse directly into the muscles. So the oxygen can go directly from the atmosphere into their tissues. It says, I, the uh, next objective, objective three, says identify the following components of the human respiratory system. So we wanna talk about how the human respiratory system differs from an insect. Well, it's very different. For one thing, gas exchange in humans isn't between the atmosphere and the tissues directly. It's actually between the atmosphere and the blood. And then it's the blood that transports oxygen to our tissues and all the cells in our body. So this is why we have a circulatory system. The circulatory system actually carries oxygen to every place in our body where we need it. And where does the, um, the gas and the blood come in contact? or the atmosphere and the blood come in contact, that is in areas within our lungs called the alveoli. So let's follow the movement of oxygen through our respiratory system. First, it's gotta pass the epiglottis. This is a little flap that covers our, our windpipe and prevents food from going in there. So oxygen will go past our epiglottis, 
through our trachea, which have a bunch of little rings around it. Then it will move into these two branches, one going into each lung called the bronchi. The bronchi are branched even further once they get into each lung called the bronchioles. And at the end of each bronchiole, we have this, these little sacs, and that's where the alveoli are. The alveoli come in direct contact with our capillaries. They're surrounded by our little blood vessels. And this is where oxygen can diffuse into our blood. And the alveoli have many little tiny sacs on them and that increases the surface area for gas exchange to happen. Next is says, uh, so you wanna make sure you can actually recognize uh, these different structures and know their function within the respiratory system. Objective four says describe the mechanism by which gases enter and leave the human lung. Well, how do we actually get air into our lungs or out of our lungs? I mean, it's something we don't really think about because it, it happens naturally. Well, we do this using a muscle below our lungs called the diaphragm. The diaphragm, and this is spelled incorrectly, there should be a P here instead of a G, but this is the diaphragm. And how does this work? So because the diaphragm is a muscle, it's going to relax and contract like a muscle does. What do you think happens to the diaphragm when you breathe in? Do you think it's contracting or it's relaxing? I have an easy way to remember that. Okay, so breathe in real quick. Actually do this with me. So we breathe in and now breathe out. When do you feel more relaxed? Well, when I breathe out, it's kind of like you're taking a sigh. It's very relaxing. So that's a good way to think about this. When I breathe in, that takes a lot of work. So my diaphragm is contracting. And what's happening there is the volume in my lungs is increasing. And this causes the air pressure in my lungs to decrease. And so air is pulled into there, okay? Because the volume is expanding. So it pulls the air in. However, when you breathe out, you're very relaxed. And that's because your diaphragm's relaxing. And when it relaxes, it folds up. So what's happening to the volume in your lungs? Think about this as like a balloon, right? It's like almost like it's being squeezed. It's losing volume. And whenever you lose volume, you increase the air pressure. So it pushes the air out. So as you notice in both of these examples, the air is always moving from an area where there's more pressure to an area where there's less pressure. Okay, let's do a sample exam question on this topic. Here we have a model of the lungs. Your instructor probably showed this to you in discussion. Here we have two balloons opened or connected to the outside atmosphere through a tube. And then we have this chamber here representing the chest cavity and this structure down here in the bottom that's representing the diaphragm so you could pull it down or push it up. It's asking if the diaphragm were pulled down, which of the following would be true? So before we read these options here, let's first think about what would happen if we pull the diaphragm down. If you pull the diaphragm down in this picture, what would happen to the air or the volume inside the chamber, inside the chest cavity? Would it increase or decrease? So if we pull this thing down here, let's see what would happen. Pulling it down. Well, we can see the volume would increase here. If the volume increases, that means the amount of pressure in there will decrease. So we'll pull air into the into those balloons. And if we look down here at the options that we have, we can see that our first option here, letter A, states exactly that. The pressure in the chamber would go down and the balloons would fill with air. Okay, so you could also think about this as you're contracting, the diaphragm is being contracted and being pulled down and that's when you breathe in. Objective number five says classify organisms as endotherms or ectotherms and note the advantages and disadvantages associated with each of these thermal strategies. 
So we already talked about what type of animals are ectotherms and endotherms. Let's first talk about let's next talk about the advantages and disadvantages of each of these. So being an ectotherm, some of the advantages of this is that it's energetically cheap, right? They don't have to use energy to maintain or produce body heat. However, a disadvantage of this, of being an ectotherm, remember they have to get all their heat from their environment. So they're pretty much prisoners of their environment. If the environment's too cold, well, they're not going to be able to produce enough heat to do anything. So this is why some organisms, or this is why ectotherms like snakes and stuff don't live up in the Arctic because they couldn't survive up there. They couldn't produce any body heat. Another disadvantage of being an ectotherm is that, as I just said, they're restricted in the range of environments where they can survive. Being an endotherm, however, some of the advantages of this is that they can sustain high levels of activity and no matter what the temperature is. If it's really cold outside, you can still run, right? And that's because you can produce enough body heat to allow you to do that too. And you can produce enough energy to allow you to do that. Another advantage of being an endotherm is that you can live in a wide range of environments. You're not a prisoner of your environment. You can go out in the cold, you can go out where it's warm, and you can live and survive in both of these types of environments. However, there's a huge disadvantage of being an endotherm, and that is it's very energetically costly to maintain a constant body temperature. You must constantly consume food, right? Consume uh, food and um, produce energy in order to keep, maintain that body temperature. An example of this would be, let's look at a snake versus a, an organism like a bat, okay? So a snake is an ectotherm. If somebody ever has a snake as a pet, how often do you think they have to feed it? Usually they feed, might feed it one mouse maybe every two weeks or so, and that snake will do fine. However, a tiny little bat, so one of these tiny little bats that are out flying at night, they have to produce so much energy just to maintain their body temperature. A bat has to eat about 600 insects every single hour just to maintain their body temperature, just to stay alive. And some bats can even eat up to their body weight of food every single night. Um, and they need to do this again just, just for survival. So being an endotherm, being something that has to maintain a body temperature requires a lot of energy. With that, um, let's look at the last objective. It says describe the relationship between metabolic rate and body size. This kind of makes sense logically. The larger you are, the more oxygen you will consume. And you can see this in this graph here. So the body mass increases as we move to the right. Don't worry about how this is in a logarithmic scale. Just know that, I mean, as you go to the right, the body mass is getting larger. And you can see that both in an ectotherm and an endotherm, the oxygen consumption increases as they get larger. One important thing that you want to know from this graph is that an endotherm's body or oxygen consumption is always going to be higher than an ectotherm's of the same mass. So if we were to look here, at this body mass, go up, we would see that an ectotherm of that body mass would consume about this amount of oxygen. And if you go up, though, an endotherm of that same body mass would consume a lot more oxygen. Okay, so being an endotherm just is more energetically costly. Another thing that we need to talk about here that's really important is this is showing the relationship between oxygen consumption and body mass. But what if we want to look at weight-specific oxygen consumption compared to body mass? Then we see something a little bit different here. What we see here in endotherms is as the body mass increases, their weight-specific metabolic rate decreases, actually. So although an elephant must consume a lot more oxygen than a mouse or a tiny little shrew, the amount of oxygen that an elephant has to consume per gram of tissue is a lot less than a shrew would have to consume. 
So why does this happen? Well, this all has to do again with surface area to volume ratio. Smaller animals have a higher surface area to volume ratio. So what this means is that they have more surface area relative to their volume than something that's larger. And having a very high surface area to volume ratio means that they don't have enough volume to help them maintain body heat. So an organism that's really small, like a shrew or like a bat, must consume a lot more energy relative to their size um, than something like an elephant. Okay? Because they, have, they cannot maintain their body temperature very well. So this is a very important relationship to remember. Let's do two more practice problems. Which animal here has the highest total oxygen consumption? These are probably some of the most difficult questions for students to answer, but if you just remember the rules, it's actually pretty simple. All right, so which one has the highest total oxygen consumption? Well, here we can see, first you wanna think about, do we have an ectotherm or endotherm? Well, a bat is an endotherm, it's furry. We have a snake here, that's an ectotherm, and we have a hippo. That would be an endotherm. So right away, we're looking for the highest total oxygen consumption. We can cross out the ectotherm. Oops, let me go back. Cross this out because we know ectotherms do not use as much oxygen as an endotherm. So now we have two left. Since we're talking about the total amount of oxygen consumed, well, it's gonna be the larger animal, larger endotherm. And so hippo would be correct for this one. However, if the question was asking about weight-specific oxygen consumption, which one has the highest? Again, we can cross out the ectotherm because endotherms will always have a higher weight or higher oxygen consumption, right? No matter what. And now we're left with the bat and the hippo. We know that smaller animals have a harder time maintaining their body temperature. So relative to their weight, they're gonna use more energy. So smaller, anim smaller endotherms have a higher weight specific oxygen consumption. Hopefully that helps. Uh, just remember that larger endotherms consume more total oxygen. However, smaller organisms, smaller endotherms have a higher amount of oxygen consumed per gram of their tissue. So higher weight specific oxygen consumption.